Hey everybody, welcome to JPD Weekly. Hope you are doing well today. Uh, we have some very important things to be talking about today. How do you know if you're following a New Age Satanist or a Christian pastor? You know, unfortunately, we live in a time where so much New Age theology has crept into the church, and many Christians don't even know it. Many Christians don't really know what to look for. They don't know uh, the roots, so they don't know how to see, you know, how these things have sprung up through time. So there's a lot of things in the church that we as Christians shouldn't have any part in. And a lot of it, a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, like, like the original seed of thought, where something leads. Uh, so, you know, for example, some people say, well, uh, you, you know, yoga should be fine because it's just stretches and I don't do any of the new age stuff. Well, you got to see how that stuff was actually developed because those specific poses were developed uh, by channeling false gods. Uh, but those specific moves were taught by false gods to man to venerate them. So it's not just doing stretches, uh, whether you know it or not, that that's a case where you, you are actually doing something that was taught by false gods to man to be used in order to honor them with. Now, not everything's like that, because, you know, for example, some people would say, well, does that mean that you can't play cards because witches use cards? And, and you know, maybe even what we have is a playing deck of cards was originally developed for witchcraft. Well, that's see, that's different because the actual card themselves, if you're playing a game of canasta or something, you're, you're not doing the specific moves or casting the specific spell or using it in the specific way that uh, that, that, that a witch would to cast some spell with, right? It, it's not being used in the same way. Just like stretching in and of itself is fine, right? Uh, just not those specific stretches in that specific order because they're meant to communicate something to a false deity. Uh, so it's the, it's the same thing here, you know, playing cards are fine, you know, if you want to play a game of canasta with your family, that's fine, but if you were to take the, the cards and use them specifically in the right order for, uh, that, you know, that was developed as some spell to venerate some god or something, then that would be an issue. So there's a lot of things like that that have sprung up, and most Christians don't know it, most pastors don't know it, and unfortunately we live in a time where there's a lot of false teachers who don't know that they are false teachers because they've been deceived. Some do it knowingly. There are some people within the New Age movement that will infiltrate churches on purpose. Uh, there are there, There's people with, within witchcraft and sorcery and stuff that do the same thing. Um, though that, I, I, I don't think that's as common as just a lot of pastors accepting New Age practices and beliefs, not knowing that they are actually new age. So we don't want to fall into saying that if something originates in a certain way, then it automatically makes it bad forever. Again, um, playing cards, you know, if, if they were developed, if the whole reason that playing cards even exist, even the number, you know, 52 cards, if, if, if the whole reason that they even exist was because some witches, you know, hundreds of years ago, uh, invented them. Well, we're not using them for that. And we're not, doing the spells. So it, it wouldn't be the, it wouldn't be the same thing. It, it would be like if you wanted to light some candles in your house, you, you know, just because witches will use candles for spells doesn't mean that there's something wrong intrinsically with the candle or like incense or something. Um, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with that. You know, sometimes I burn incense because I like the smell of it and that's it. I don't meditate with it. It doesn't relax me. It's not, I don't even use it for like aromatherapy. You know, uh, some people do, but, but me, I, I just, I like the way it smells and that's really all it is. Um, and so I think things like that, you know, are okay. So, so we, we can't just look at the origin of something and just say, because of the origin, it's bad, but it depends on if that origin, if that origin is bad. And then if that origin, um, that, that meaning is carried on through like, like yoga today. Uh, so that's why I would say, you know, we shouldn't be doing yoga, um, do different stretches, you know, and that's fine. Um, and, uh, but, but then there are some other things that are okay. So that, that's kind of the dividing line. I think what can really help though, is if we know what new age, uh, practitioners were teaching when new age was becoming kind of, uh, more mainstream. And this, this does have roots in Satanism, Luciferianism. And mo most people don't realize that. And that's what I want to get into today. I want to show how the main new age thought leaders in the past, the people that new agers will still, um, We'll still talk about today, 
were actually steeped in Satanism, in Luciferianism. And um, obviously those two are, are two sort of separate things, but when, when I say it, I just mean venerating Satan. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really have an interest in whatever new meaning Satanists want to put on it this week. But um, So I wanted to look at some of that today. Now, if you followed me for any number of years, then you know I, I, I have come out of New Age, you know, years and years and years ago before I was involved in Christian ministry or anything like that. I was heavily entrenched in New Age myself. I was raised a Christian, but I fell away from the church, and I um, got into New Age for a variety of, uh, of really bad reasons, and um, it was a really bad experience. I mean, at, at first, I enjoyed it, and I thought it was great, and um, but then I saw it for what it was. I actually detail that whole story in uh, my book with Stephen Bancars, who also came out of New Age, called Second Coming of the New Age, uh, and much of the information that we're going to be talking about today comes from that book, so if you want to find the sources and stuff, you can, you can check that out. Um, but uh, Second Coming of the New Age by... Uh, Stephen Bancars and Josh Peck. That's uh, where you can find that. But um, so I'm not going to get into, you know, all of my backstory, but just I've come out of this stuff and I know what to look for and I know how I was deceived. And I know how I was deceiving or trying to deceive other Christians without me even knowing I was doing that. I thought I was helping them. I thought I was liberating them. And New Agers today think they're doing the same thing. So we have to understand that most of them are not out there teaching this stuff because they're trying to be malicious or anything. Most of them are not doing it for that. Uh, some are, but mo most New Agers today, just your average run-of-the-mill run New Ager, they, they are going to try to, to teach you their beliefs because they honestly think they're helping you. They honestly think they're getting you out of some kind of spiritual bondage that you're in or, or ignorance or something like that. So what we want to do is not be mean to them or mock them or make fun of them because then they'll just shut down and they won't listen to you. If we, if we want to change their mind, and we do, and it is possible because it happened to me, uh, and if it can happen to me, it can happen to anybody, but if we want to change their mind, then we need to know uh, what they believe better than they do themselves. And that's actually not that difficult of a task because in, in New Age, it's all it's mostly about experience and feeling. And it's not so much about like history or theology or, or that kind of stuff. So it's actually really, it's, it's simple to gently, lovingly, respectfully, you know, show that, you know, your beliefs here are rooted in Satanism, and I'm not just saying that to be, you know, exaggerative or, or hyperbolic or whatever. They're, they're, this actually does come from Satanism, and I can prove it. And uh, and I, I want to warn you of that because this can open the door for like really evil spirits, uh, and you know you you don't want to mess with those. That's what happened with me personally. Um, it, it totally opened the door. I was really into astral projection and stuff, and it really opened the door to demonic, really horrible things that you don't want in your life. Uh, and they they made our you know me, me and my wife they they made our uh, lives hell for a while until I truly learned what a relationship with Jesus is all about. And I decided that I didn't want these things anymore. You know, I wanted Jesus. So it's all about making that choice. Um, and there's no secret knowledge to it or anything. It's just, do you want to follow Jesus or not? Do you, do you, are you going to trust in Jesus for your eternal life or are you going to trust in yourself? I mean, that really is what it comes down to. And if you are going to deny yourself and just trust in Jesus, then that's how you start a relationship with him. And then that, that's the beginning of a, of a lifelong relationship you can have with, uh, with God, with, with the creator of the universe. And it's not in some new agey subjective way. It's very objective. You start reading the Bible, you find out God's preferences, what he likes, what he doesn't like. And just like any relationship, you learn that about him. And, you, and, and, and then because, because you're not on equal playing field with God, you know, uh, because he's up here, we're down here, we start to conform ourselves to his likes and dislikes likes. Uh, and that's called edification. That's the process of being a Christian. Once you're saved, you're saved. But, uh, you know, once, once you give your life to Christ, that's, that's it. You're going to heaven. So now the rest of your life is all about edification. It's about growing in the Lord. Uh, and there are some eternal rewards that come along with that. But, um, I'm getting a little bit off track, but uh, so that's, that's what the Christian walk is really all about. 
Um, so I think that we as Christians, we can help in that edification process to ourselves, but we can also help um, make new Christians from new agers, you know, and, and teach them the right way. We can get them saved and then start discipling them. Uh, and we can, we can get this edification thing going if we understand how to talk to them and understand how to show them in a loving way what they actually believe. Because when I was in New Age, I did not know any, I, I, didn't, I didn't want anything to do with Satanism, and I didn't know that the two went hand in hand. But I'll also tell you, I was incredibly sensitive back then, as most New Agers are today, and if a Christian would have came to me and said, you know, that's just Satanism, right? I would have not listened, I would have shut it out, and I never would have talked to that person again. I, I would have thought that he was ignorant or something, and he just didn't know because he's not as smart as me. So, we have to be, we have to be uh, careful how we talk to people if we want to change their minds. If we just want to be prideful and spout off, uh, spout off uh, at them how much we know and how stupid they are, well, then you may as well not even call yourself a Christian because that's not what Christ wants us to be doing. Um, he wants us to be making disciples of all nations, and you're not going to be making disciples that way. Okay, so with that introduction, uh, modern New Age as we know it today came into being not only by borrowing from ancient Gnosticism, which we talked about last week, uh, if you want, you can go check out that video, um, and the Luciferian philosophy pushed by enemies of God and scripture, but also from 19th and 20th century Western occultism. So that's what I, I want to show that link today. Now, surprisingly, in terms of their doctrine of man, ancient Gnosticism, Western occultism, and the modern New Age teach really similar principles. So Last week, we talked about the ancient roots in Gnosticism and how Gnosticism is, is really a terrible theology and terrible philosophy. I mean, they, they totally denigrated women, um, and it, it's just it's a really bad um, view of the world. But now I want to fast forward into our uh, Western way of life, and, and just as early as even 100 years ago, um, e even earlier than that, we, we can see how these New Age proponents uh, really started off as Satanists, and they just called Satanism New Age because it was more palatable to people who didn't want to be Satanists. Now, these three main beliefs, again, Gnosticism, Western Occultism, and Modern New Age, um, the, the main takeaways from these three belief systems are, one, that the God of the Bible is the enemy of human enlightenment, two, that Christianity is an outdated system that keeps man in a lower state of consciousness, and three, people should do whatever they want regardless of the consequences, basically as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. And, and you know, we, we, well, even then, though, they'll even bend on that part. Um... For example, they would not care so much if they hurt the feelings of a Christian, you know, if, if they're spouting off their beliefs, because they would say that that's like the Christian's fault because they're, they're ignorant or whatever. Um, but we're supposed to show tolerance and restraint, of course. So you see the double standard there. But these, um, these three ideas are fundamental to occult teachings and were first introduced by the serpent in the garden. Uh, again, we talked about that last week, who, um, who actually uh, was praised, is praised, the serpent in the garden is praised by New Age teachers as being the first intelligent intelligence to free man from being enslaved to Yahweh. We talked a little bit about that last week. Um, Satan, ancient Gnosticism, and Western occultism all chalk Yahweh as the obstacle in the uh, pursuit of man's self-divinity, and they revere Lucifer as the great bringer of light. Now, most New Agers, some New Agers will just come out and say that. Most don't know, and most wouldn't say that. Uh, but if they've been in New Age long enough and if they've stayed in it, then they know what that's all about. Now, surprisingly, the entire New Age movement owes its origins to teachers who hold Satan in a higher regard than Jesus. Uh, one name that probably is very familiar is Helena Blavatsky. She was a, a Russian occultist, author, co-founder of the Theosophical Society, whose purpose was to promote the esoteric religion of theosophy. Uh, she claimed to have traveled the world in 1849 when she met a group of interdimensional spiritual leaders called the Masters of the Ancient Wisdom, who then sent her to Tibet. She claimed that while in Tibet, she was trained to develop a deeper understanding of the connections between religion, philosophy, and science. Uh, but critics and biographers have by and large argued that some or all of these world travels and experiences were fictitious. Uh, total lie. Now, by the early uh, 1870s, Blavatsky had become involved in the spiritualist movement, which taught that the spirits of the dead exist and are able to communicate with the living. Uh, though she disagreed and even argued against the idea that the contacted 
entities were actually spirits of the dead. So then she moved to America. She gained public fame as a spirit medium, which also earned her accusations of lying to the public about her abilities. In 1875, uh, Blavatsky, along with Henry Steele Alcott and William Kwan Judge, founded the Theosophical Society, which included... Um, or introduced Eastern mysticism, Gnosticism, occultism into the mainstream. Now, following that, in 1877, uh, Blavatsky published Isis Unveiled, which taught her theosophical belief system. So she asserted that theosophy was a re was a reviving of a, a universal ancient wisdom that is at the root of all humanity's religions. So, you know, today they'll say that, like, every religion leads to God. And so it, it started because of this kind of thinking. Now, in 1880, Blavatsky moved to India, became one of the first Westerners to officially convert to Buddhism. In 1885, she moved back to Europe, where she uh, published three more books, The Secret Doctrine, The Key to Theosophy, and The Voice of the Silence. Now, shortly later, she died of influenza. So her, the, her theosophical doctrine spurred the spread of Hinduism and Buddhism in the West, which led to Western esoteric movements such as uh, Ariosophy, um, Anthroposophy, and of course the New Age movement that we see today. But all the Eastern influences we have in, in America, this is why. So Blavatsky was remembered as an enlightened guru by some and as a fraudulent liar by others. Now, while she was writing the book... Um, she would both most be remembered for her first book, Isis Unveiled. While she was writing that, uh, Blavatsky claimed that a second consciousness inspired her ideas, which she referred to as, quote, the lodger who is in me, end quote. The book connected uh, Western esotericism of, of um, her, hermeticism and the Neoplatonism to ancient wisdom and spiritualism. Now, in Isis Unveiled, Blavatsky spoke out against Darwinian evolution by saying that it only dealt with the physical world and not with anything spiritual. Uh, so in that way, but the book also became a huge success, though it received a large amount of negative press. It was, uh, and, and I'll, I'll say that, you know, that while she said that about Darwinism, she did like believe in like the spiritual kind of Darwinism thing. I mean, her work has been used actually to support Darwinism, which is strange. Um, now, it was stated that the book extensively quoted about 100 other books, yet it provided no actual acknowledgement. But despite the negative reviews, the initial print of 1,000 copies sold out in a week. Though Isis Unveiled was a large success, the, the Theosophical Society had basically faded to nothing by this time, despite new lodges throughout the States and London uh, being established and prominent figures like Thomas Edison and Abner Doubleday joining. Now, Blavatsky, though Blavatsky seemed to be a spiritually enlightened person to some in her own day and to many even today, uh, she actually held some really evil views concerning race and religion. This, this is what they don't want to talk about. So scholar of religion Olav Hammer noted that some of Blavatsky writings were, quote, overtly racist, end quote. He said that her anti-Semitism, quote, derives from the unfortunate position of Judaism as the origin of Christianity, end quote, and refers to, quote, the intense dislike she felt for Christianity, uh, end quote. Um, Blavatsky wrote, Blavatsky wrote this, quote, Judaism built solely on phallic worship has become one of the latest creeds in Asia and theologically a religion of hate and malice towards everyone and everything outside themselves, end quote. Uh, so, I mean, disgusting views. She wrote that Jews were, quote, degenerate in spirituality, um, end quote, and that Aboriginal Australians were, quote, half animal, end quote. Um, so this shows how evil this woman was. It, it, it's also, uh, it, it is only a, a wonder how much of her philosophy contributed actually to the Holocaust as it has been reported that The Secret Doctrine by Blavatsky was a favorite work of Adolf Hitler, and of course it would be because of the anti-Semitism. Um, see, this is what proponents of Blavatsky and even New Age today, they don't like this connection, because obviously pretty much everybody knows racism is a horrible, horrible evil, and nobody really wants to take part in it. You know, nobody here in the West, they're... they're no one really, a lot of people do without knowing it, and then they project it onto others, but that's a whole separate thing. Now, um... 
Despite Blavatsky's overt racism and intolerance to religion, her development of theosophy has been cited as a major influence of the New Age movement. Even the New Age Encyclopedia recognized this, stating, quote, no single organization or movement has contributed so many components to the New Age movement as the Theosophical Society. It has been the major force in the dissemination of occult literature in the West in the 20th century, end quote. Uh, so, New Age, as it is today, sprung up, by and large, the majority of it, from an overt racist, from, from somebody who is overtly racist, especially against uh, Jewish people, uh, but, but against blacks and, you know, against, against uh, other races as well. Now, in fact, the, uh, the chronology of the New Age movement section in the New Age Encyclopedia, again, this is the New Age Encyclopedia, you can go look this up, um, begins with the formation of the Theosophical Society in 1875. However, like I mentioned earlier, the New Age movement itself is designed to pick the things about spiritual teachings that it likes and ignore the rest, which is a, a responsibility that lies with the individual student rather than a group of like-minded believers or educated theologians. So, for example, something about Blavatsky that gets overlooked was her open con uh, commendation, uh, veneration of Satan, and the wonderful work he did in delivering free will to man in the Garden of Eden. Um, so given that she is the mother of the New Age movement, that's what she's actually called, the following quotes should concern us. This comes from Blavatsky herself. She says, God created Satan, the fairest and wisest of all his creatures in this part of his universe, and made him prince of the world and of the power of the air. Thus Satan, being perfected in wisdom and beauty, his vast empire is our earth, if not the whole solar system. Certainly no other angelic power of greater or even equal dignity has been revealed to us. So that obviously totally disregards Jesus and puts Satan in his place. Uh... She also wrote, uh, she also said, uh, or, or wrote, it is Satan who is the god of our planet and the only god, and this without any elusive metaphor to its wickedness and depravity, for he is one with the Logos, the first son, eldest of the gods. Can you believe that? So she's actually perverting the Trinity by trying to cram Lucifer up in there. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's uh, horrific. Um, here's something else. Uh, she also said, in this case, it is but natural, even from the dead letter standpoint, to view Satan, the serpent of Genesis, as the real creator and benefactor, the father of spiritual mankind. For it is he who was the harbinger of light, brilliant, radiant Lucifer, her, who opened the eyes of the automaton created by Jehovah, as alleged, and he who was the first to whisper, in the day ye eat thereof, ye shall be as Elohim, knowing good and evil, can only be regarded in the light of a savior. Here's another one. She, uh, she said, Satan, the enemy of God, is in reality the highest divine spirit. So putting Satan above, above God. Uh, she said, Lucifer is divine and terrestrial light, the Holy Ghost and Satan at, at one and the same time. I have a hard time even quoting that. I mean, that is just clear, clear blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, of which there is no forgiveness, as we read about. Once somebody has gotten that bad and has gone that far, I, I think Scripture makes it clear they're not coming back. You know, there, there. I don't, I don't think there's, there's any chance that, like, on her deathbed, she really, gave, she decided to give her life to Jesus or anything. I think, as, as, as Scripture seems to indicate, if I'm understanding it right, once somebody gets to the point where they're willingly, openly blaspheming the Holy Spirit like that, then that's it. They're, they're not going to come back. They're not going to uh, repent. So, I mean, it's, it's absolutely disgusting, yet this is where New Age comes from. This, this is the roots of it. And it's not even, these roots aren't even that old. A couple of generations, that's it, in this country. So the New Age was founded upon the teachings of someone who openly praised Lucifer or Satan for his influence on mankind. Uh, it's common knowledge in the history of religions that nobody has contributed more to the development of New Age spirituality in the West, and she did so as a proud Luciferian who uh, demonized the God of the Bible and praised his enemy. Uh, so Blavatsky, however, is not the only founder of the New Age movement uh, with dark occult ties. There are, uh, there are more. So, for example, Alice Bailey. 
Now, following Helena Blavatsky, Alice Bailey wrote more than 24 books on theosophy. She was one of the first writers to use the term New Age in referencing uh, her belief in a coming age of Aquarius, which is a term you guys probably have heard of before, uh, which would be at a time of, uh, it, it was looked at as a time of spiritual enlightenment within humanity as a whole. Bailey wrote on a wide variety of topics, including meditation, healing, spiritual psychology, and telepathy. I, this is why you got to be careful of stuff today. Like, like at any time, like, they'll use different terms, but it's rooted in the same thing, like, like quantum healing. You know, something like that. Don't that that stuff is rooted in this new age Satanist stuff, and and it's not. There's there's nothing real or there, there's nothing good in it. Uh, but that this is the kind of stuff that she was involved in. She claimed uh, most of her work had been telepathically dictated to her by uh, Dewal. Cool. I, I'm probably saying that wrong. Uh, if you want to Google it, it's D-J-W-A-L-K-H-U-L. But she described this being as a master of wisdom. Uh, Bailey's writings differed in some ways to Blavatsky's teachings of theosophy, but they also had a lot in common. Bailey was heavily influenced by Blavatsky and became influenced uh, or became involved in the Theosophical Society in uh, 1917. In 1921, Alice and Foster Bailey were married, and the following year, following the uh, Lucius Trust, which set up the arcane school that gave uh, instruction on meditation, uh, Alice and Foster Bailey also founded Lucifer Publishing Company, which later was changed to Lu Lucius uh, Public Publishing Co., if any doubts about the satanic origins of New Age could be questioned, one can still see the early copies of the Lucifer online uh, publishing and explicitly anti-Christian worldview. So Bailey continued her work until her death in 1949, and like Blavatsky, also received criticism for the racist themes in her material. Now, while New Age and Satanism are generally seen as two different things in our modern culture, they actually have nearly identical roots and teachings. So from their doctrine of man to their theology to their doctrine of the afterlife to practices uh, they both endorse, they mirror Luciferianism and spiritual Satanism to a T. Uh, this may seem like a controversial claim, according to New Age believers, but it can be clearly demonstrated by comparative analysis. And as we will see, even famed occultists and Satanists understood this fact. Uh, well, we have a lot more to talk about because I want to get into Aleister Crowley. Now, I know um, maybe some people that have been following this are like, Aleister Crowley, oh my gosh, we talk about him to death, you know. Uh, but, but there's actually, what's not often talked about is how much influence Aleister Crowley's teachings ended up having on New Age and then New Age on the church. So there's Crowleyism in the church. Uh, um, by, by way of New Age. And we do need to talk about that. We're going to do that in the members only section. Uh, so we will get into that right after this. Dr. Ken Johnson and I, if, uh, if those of you out there are familiar with Dr. Ken Johnson, he's been a guest on before. We're going to have him back on again to talk about this calendar. But um, he has a website called dsscalendar.org, and it's basically an online version of the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, which is a great resource. It's for free. Anybody can use it. But it does also mean that you have to – it's not an app. It's a website. So you have to pull out your phone every time you want to look at it and, and scroll around and look for things. So I reached out to Ken and I said, hey, what would you think about us uh, kind of like going into business together? But what, what would you say about producing a print calendar? Because I, I know how to do that. He already designed the calendar, so the hard work's done. I know how to get it into print and get it out to people. What, what do you say? And he was all for it. He was excited about it. So Ken and I worked together and produced the ancient Dead Sea Scroll calendar in print form. And this is for this year. Uh, and it, it's it's absolutely beautifully uh, printed. There are eight different styles, eight different uh, versions of this calendar that people can get if they want to. But basically what you have is, I don't know if people can see that, but you have the Dead Sea Scroll uh, calendar on the top with all the feast days and everything. And then on the bottom, you have the normal, just American, regular kind of calendar. Even uh, even if you if you get the square one, the square style, you even get like pictures for St. Patrick's Day and the holidays and stuff like that. Uh, so that is for this year. It starts in March. So don't think, well, it's four months into the year by now. There's no point in getting one. The Dead Sea Scroll calendar starts in March. So it's a great time to pick one up. But as I said, 
We also have uh, several other options. We have three different poster versions, which are just, you know, they're just posters. Uh, we have three different versions of that. We have um, a desk calendar style. Uh, so, you know, th this is like if you if you have a family member or a friend or something that has a desk job or something, this is this is a great gift. Uh, and then we also have this little CD case version, which is, I thought this was a uh, pretty innovative and cool, but it just opens like a CD, but you can stand it on your desk like that. And then it's, uh, you just have cards. They, they come out as cards. There's, uh, the calendar on one side, and then there's, uh, the American holidays on the, on the back side, and you just set it on your, on your desk or wherever like that. So if people want that, there is a link in the description below. And by the time this episode airs, we should have uh, the link right at dailyrenegade.com. So if you go to dailyrenegade.com right now, you should, if I'm timing this out right, you should see a graphic right on the page on the login screen. You don't have to be a member to take advantage of this, but uh, it'll, uh, we'll put it right on the login screen. DailyRenegade.com. You'll see a graphic there. You can click on that, pick your calendar, and uh, we'll we'll keep doing this every year. Or you can go to Dr. Ken Johnson's website, BibleFacts.org, or DSScalendar.org, and you can see the same graphic there and get it there. Either way, it takes you to the same place, and uh, your purchase of a calendar goes both to help support Ken's ministry and Daily Renegade. So uh, if you already know that you love us both and you want a calendar, that's the place to go. Uh, okay, so we are going to take a break and we're going to pick this back up in the members only section. If you haven't had a chance yet, again, please go to dailyrenegade.com and get a membership today. If you get a monthly or yearly membership, you'll have full access uh, to my newest film dealing with how Christians should look at the UFO disclosure movement that's been opening up more and more in our government today. It seems like every day now we're getting new uh, news headlines on how the government is admitting to more and more and more. Well, how are we as Christians to respond to that? And what is this connection between UFO disclosure events and major events in Israel's uh, history and geopolitics in the Middle East? Because things are heating up there too. And these two seemingly different things uh, converge somehow. So the film gets into all that. Um, and it, it, I'm in it. Derek Gilbert is in it. Uh, we have uh, Lieutenant Colonel Robert McGinnis, uh, Steve Ciccolani, uh, Pastor Steve, if you guys uh, know him from, from YouTube and other various places. Says my wife Christina is in it, so it's a great lineup. It's also narrated by Zachary Lautitas. If you're familiar with that show Prison Break, he was in that. He's been in a couple other movies and stuff since then, but he actually got me and Derek's book, The Day the Earth Stands Still, which is what this film is based on. Uh, he got a hold of that uh, about a year ago, and uh, it, it really inspired him to reach out to me and Derek and then do some research uh, on his own. So we're going to be having him on the show sometime soon because he's got some amazing insights. Uh, especially just being connected with Hollywood and seeing what's going on there. This is a truly historic moment. It will be known as the Abraham Accord. Ever since the news broke of the peace agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, many Christians have been wondering what it all means. Is it significant? Is it momentous and historic? Or could it even be prophetic? Most importantly, after this, what comes next? Everybody said this would be impossible. That film, What Comes Next, it is only available for paying members, but if you want a free trial, there are still some free things for you. Uh, most specifically, we have a free episode of The Sharpening Report right now with financial expert and Christian Terry Saka right on the front page of DailyRenegade.com, which explains the financial crisis that we're in now and how we as Christians can safely protect our assets with an actual Christian company. This company is amazing. It's basically a ministry effort for us Christians, and it's done through Precious Metal. 
sale. So you can go there uh, or just go to Cornerstone Assets in the link in the description below and request more uh, information. I have some silver myself, and I believe that every Christian should absolutely be doing this instead of trusting satanic organizations and doomed to fail currency options such as fiat and the banks and all, all of that with you with your resources uh, and what you leave behind for your family. At least with Cornerstone, you're um, working with Christians. You, you know, you have to protect yourself, your family, your assets, and Cornerstone is the only Christian company that I trust with something so important and vital. So check it out. Uh, more information at dailyrenegade.com. Com. Go ahead and watch that episode of the Sharpening Report. It's free for everybody and get the information. Okay, if you haven't had a chance to do so, head on over to dailyrenegade.com and get a membership and you will get the rest of this episode. Uh, it's $10 a month or $100 a year, a year. If you can do the $100 a year, get that. It's a better deal. You get money off. It's actually cheaper in the long run and you don't have to think about it for a long time. So that's a good deal. So head on over. Uh, if you are watching this for free on YouTube or elsewhere, then thank you so much for watching. Uh, members, hang on the line. We're going to get right back into uh, Alistair Crowley. Everybody else, love you all. Take care. God bless.